and we are live. Good evening and welcome to Explorers, Seekers of the Truth. As always, I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, Les Sincavage. Tonight, we're going to talk about a creature that is said to be a messenger of disaster. And we'll get into that subject shortly, but how are you doing, Les? I'm good, my friend. How are you doing? Well, I'm good. All right. Well, that's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Better than last week. Unfortunately, last week we had... Uh, we had to cancel the or postpone the show until this week because of a uh, an electrical storm that I had in my area of Pennsylvania and actually wiped out the in uh, the entire town that are provided by my uh, that are provided internet by my internet provider and uh, so we unfortunately had to put the show off and uh, you know but we're back we're live we're here uh, so I thank anybody who's joining in to listen to us tonight. Um, and uh, you could also, uh, while we're doing the show, you could talk to us uh, live, chat live with us uh, in the comments on the Facebook page. Or if you're looking at watching us through Smile Time, you could uh, comment on the live chat on Smile Time. You could also get in touch with us through uh, Facebook or on Twitter at Explorers Group. Or you could email us with any questions or any ideas for upcoming shows at Explorers Seekers of the Truth at gmail.com. So, chat. Would you please introduce our featured cryptid for this evening? Well, tonight we're going to be covering a cryptid that has uh, developed into a cross spectrum of paranormal influence. Mm -hmm. It has been attached to a First Nations curse on the community, a secret military experiment, the herald of impending disasters, a cause for the men in black to investigate, from one small community to a nationally known creature, I'm talking about none other than the Mothman. Ooh Our discussion tonight will start with a small town in West Virginia in the year 1966, and we're going to bring it up to some of the more present-day sightings in the Chicago, greater Chicago area. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of a special night because we are actually joined by um, a guest yeah, you know, which is unusual. Our, for our us. very first guest, too, mind yes. you. Um, when we started the idea for this podcast about four years ago, I made a list of people I wanted to interview, and one name stood out, you know, above the rest of them. And you know, as luck would have it, the the person I wanted to interview actually agreed to talk to us. <laughs> so <laughs> um, tonight we're going to be talking to Mothman researcher and author Jeff Walmsley. Uh, Jeff's on the phone with us currently. Uh, hi, Jeff. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing pretty good. Thanks for having me on the show. I didn't know I was the first guest, though. You, know? you, you are, yeah. You're, you're our, our maiden voyage for uh, ah. for live interviews. So. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so thank you. <laughs> Yeah. So we're going to ask you uh, some questions, Jeff, and, and pick your brain about what the Mothman is all about or or what your feelings are of the Mothman are all about. And I'll okay. let Chad uh, start that out here. Okay. okay. So, Jeff, can you give us a little history about you and your involvement with the Mothman? Well, I was born and raised in Point Pleasant. Um, I was actually about five years old in 1966 when everything started. And our neighbors that lived just about four doors down um, were actually one of the first couples that, that reported this, whatever it was, you know, um, it was uh, Linda, Linda Scarberry and Roger Scarberry. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were, they were actually in, in the car with another couple. That was in November of 66. But um, you know, that's, I don't re remember a whole lot about it, you know, when I was that young, but as I got a little bit older, I remember being like in junior high and, you know, picking up John Keel's book and kind of leafing through it, you know, and I, I recognized a lot of the names in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got a little bit older, got into high school. And, you know, I, I, back then, you know, it wasn't nearly as as uh, a phenomenon as it is now. You know, I mean, there was still people coming to Point Pleasant to, to investigate and to ask questions and stuff like that. But, um you know, over the years, I, I just, I thought it was really neat that, you know, all this happened, you know, just literally under my nose. I mean, you know, right, right there where I lived <laughs> and, um, I started collecting things and it seemed like I got a little more interested in the history of the town and, and, um, kind of archived a lot of different things. And then back in 2001, um, I thought it would be really cool to 
you know, come up out with a book that was more of a documentary style book with a lot of interviews and some of the people that had seen it and things like that. And then, you know, that brought a, a second book in 2005 uh, with even more archives. And uh, that kind of spawned the Mothman Festival, you know, which is about 16, 16 years old now. Wow. And, uh, well, the, the festival's coming up in two weeks. It'll be our 16th one. And That's then awesome. uh, that kind of spawned the Mothman Museum, which I started about 10 years ago. So, cool. um, so it's basically turned into a, almost like a full-time occupation hmm. because, you know, it is a worldwide, you know, phenomenon now, thanks to a lot of the movies and documentaries and, and you know, podcasts like yours, and you know, that kind of discuss the Mothman uh, story and stuff like that. So, um uh, it's it's been pretty cool. My background was in art and music. You know, I always thought I would be touring the world as a rock star. <laughs> and, <laughs> you and, and me uh, both, brother. I you ended and up me being, both. You know, into the monsters and stuff. And and uh, I had a chain of record stores for a while through the through the late eighties and nineties. And then uh, Mr. Napster came along and kind of you know ruined that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know, I, I I dabbled in some of the Mothman merchandise then. You know in the stores and stuff and mm -hmm. um, so that's that's pretty much a short synopsis there of you know how i got involved with it and stuff you know cool yeah, yeah, I actually have to admit, my, my first, first book, book on the Mothman was your first book that you had written. I had, um, oh really? Well, yeah, cool. I had never even seen uh, John Keel's book. I had actually found a copy of your book and got you know. Probably would want to hear that, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Keel's book came out, you know, back in '75. I mean, and for years and years and years, you know, that was, and it still is. That's probably the the biggest seller of uh, you know Mothman books and stuff. But yeah. uh, we had to actually get permission from him. Well, I did, you know, to use some of the stuff in those books because there were a lot of uh, actual correspondence, uh, typed, hand typed letters from him to some of the witnesses and stuff. You didn't have the internet and yeah. email and all that stuff mm -hmm. back in the 60s. So I, I have a lot of those original uh, correspondence letters, you know, him asking these witnesses, you know, if they'd been visited by any of these men in black and all kinds of cool stuff. Well, now, are, are those letters, are they on display at the museum? Yeah, there are some on display at the museum, and I still have boxes of stuff here at home that I just need to archive and put in the museum. I, I'll, I'll never run out of stuff probably for the Mothman Museum. <laughs> I'm just running out of room in the museum, but, I mean, you know, I, I have boxes and boxes of stuff that, that uh, that I've kept, you know, cool. and some of that stuff I obtained from Linda Scarberry, uh, you know, one of those original witnesses. She pretty much kept everything, mm -hmm. and uh, she passed away about five years ago, but uh, she kept everything because she told me, she said, now one day I knew that there would probably be a movie made about it, but I wanted the real story to be told, not the Hollywood version. You know? Right, right. So I was lucky enough to get, get a hold of that stuff. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Linda? I mean, being a neighbor and, you know, somebody that, you know, kind of knew her as more of a person than just an eyewitness to this. Yeah. You know, there was an age difference. I mean, you know, obviously she was, she was older than, than mm -hmm. I was. And, and, uh, I, I actually delivered papers to her. She still lived there on 30th street, you know, her and her husband and stuff. And, and at that point in time, I had no clue, you know, you know, what the connection was. And my parents knew her parents and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when, when I did talk to her, she was very, you know, soft spoken. Um, I always thought that, you know, she, she was a little uncomfortable talking about a lot of the stuff that happened and stuff that they, they saw and things like that. She, she wouldn't talk to just anybody, you know what I mean? She, um, pretty reserved, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if, if she did talk to a film crew or a, a TV crew or whatever, you know, she she made it clear to him that she was pretty uneasy about discussing it and stuff. And you, you can kind of pick that up sometimes in some of the interviews that she did. But it, it affected him. I mean, you know, um, you know, I think a lot of it came from all the ridicule that they put up with, too. Right. You right. Know, um, 
people made fun of them and and uh, but they weren't the only four that that saw it i mean there was over a hundred reported sightings you know to the police department there in in the first year and a half right um, can, can you give us a little bit more detail about linda's story well yeah basically what happened was and you know they were the first official uh reports that came through to the, the press and stuff but there were actually a few other ones before that mm -hmm. but the one in point pleasant was uh, november 15th 1966 um they were in her husband's uh he had a 57 chevy bel air mm -hmm. and i remember that car i remember it was he, he lived across the street from us uh -huh. she lived down the street and then they got married and you know they were childhood sweethearts and all that stuff but uh, they were with another couple riding around up in the TNT area, which is about nine miles nine miles north of a uh, of town. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was in World War II. That's basically where they man manufactured explosives and bombs and stuff. Okay. So that's how it got its name, the TNT area. Mm -hmm. uh, when the war ended, the government just left a lot of those structures up there, and they were driving around about eleven o'clock at night. Uh, it was a Tuesday night about 11 o'clock because I remember after what what night of the week. Mm -hmm. And um, they were driving by the old North Power Plant, which was like a three-story building. It was vacant. A lot of kids would be in and, there, in and out of there. You know, had the catwalks, the concrete catwalks and the big windows and stuff. And she said as they came down the road towards that North Power Plant, they were getting ready to go back home into town. And she said they saw what she thought was just a man in the road. You know, the headlights hit it. Mm -hmm. And she said as soon as the headlights hit it, she noticed the red eyes, almost like a – she said they were about the size of baseballs, about two inches apart. And they just thought, well, it's somebody up here in a costume or whatever. Right. And then she mm -hmm. said as they got closer to it, that's when she said the wings came out. And she said those folded out to about 10 to 12 feet which is pretty good wingspan. Oh, uh, yeah. And that's when yeah. they knew that, she, you know, she said, what, you know, what is that? And that's when they got closer to it, and she said it it turned and ran in towards the north power plant. Actually, she said it hobbled. It wasn't real graceful, you know, when it went to the plant. Mm -hmm. And they were a little concerned, and, they, you know, they, they was kind of trying to gather their thoughts. So, they went on out to the main highway, which is Route 62. They took a left, and she said, you know, they were they weren't terrified or anything, but they were a little freaked out. So she said, as they turned left onto that road, that's when she saw it again, and she said it was standing to the left of the road, the side of a big old billboard, and it was. She said it was watching us, and she said its wings went out and it shot straight up, it just went straight up in the air. And that's when they got a little concerned. They took off. They went down Route 62 and hit the long straight stretch. And that's when she said she noticed it over top of their car. Oh, that's and uh, she, the way she said that she noticed it over the car was it. she, she noticed a, a leg hanging. She was in the passenger seat. Mm -hmm. Then she looked to the right and saw a leg hanging down. And... I asked her, I said, well, how big was the wingspan? And she said it was big enough to when it flapped its wings, those wings were hitting the bottom of that car door, slamming off of the car door and stuff. So they sped up. She said they were hitting 90, 95 down the straight stretch, and she said it, it was no effort at all to stay, stay right with that car. But she said it never got in front of the car. It stayed right above it, and then it would disappear for a little bit, come back again. And uh, that's when they got a little concerned. Um, they went back into town, stopped at Tiny's Drive-In, which is at the end of our street. That's where she worked as a waitress. They ran in and talked to the owner who was closing up shop. And he, I talked to him on the phone a few years ago, and he told me, he said, you know, they were, they were terrified. He said, I'm the one who called the sheriff's department. They were afraid to go to the sheriff's department. You know, they just figured that they'd laugh at them and call them nuts and everything else. Right, right. Like a, a kid's prank or something. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and they were 19, 20 years old, you know, when it happened. Both couples were married and stuff. And that's, you know, that was the beginning of, you know, what turned into numerous encounters and sightings and, hmm. and uh, all that stuff. Now, 
can you kind of maybe describe like uh, Point Pleasant and the surrounding area during that time? Like, was there anything odd going on or? Well, before all this happened, there was a lot of UFO activity. A oh, really? And a lot of UFOs in in the Ohio Valley in general. But mm-hmm. in Point Pleasant, people were reporting a lot of strange lights in the sky. Uh, people seeing stuff flying over their house in broad daylight. Um, yeah, so the the mood was kind of set, you know, all through the, the, the 66, 68, you know, there was a lot of UFO activity and stuff. And, uh, you know, it's a small town and it still is. Um, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, employed at some of the, the, the plants and the uh, hospitals and all that kind of stuff, you know, so. Yeah, word traveled pretty pretty quick, even without the internet and Facebook and all that. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, it was uh, it, it was there was some strange things going on. Then then this happened, you know, and it pretty much brought a, a lot of attention, you know, to Point Pleasant. John Keel, you know, came to Point Pleasant and investigated. And there was a couple other writers and stuff that did the same thing. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So. Now you said that this uh, encounter with uh, with uh, Linda and her friends uh, was in 1966. You said correct, right? Uh-huh. So that was the first uh, reported sighting. When can can you kind of tell us uh, when does the legend itself start of Mothman? Well, I would probably say it started right then and there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, there were there were uh, four guys digging a grave in Clinton, in West Virginia, on November 11th, okay. which was only four days before. Clinton is about a little bit over an hour from Point Pleasant. They saw what they said it was a flying man that went over top of them when they were digging that grave. Hmm. Uh, on November 12th, 1966, there was a farmer named Noel Partridge in Salem, West Virginia, which is two hours away from Point Pleasant. He's the guy who had the dog named Bandit mm-hmm. that ran out the back door chasing a bunch of lights in his yard uh, and disappeared, you know, and then never found the dog again. Now, he, he interviewed a lot. You know, John Keel talked about him a lot. Mm-hmm. And some people thought that whatever that was in his backyard might have had some connection with, you know, what people were seeing, you know, here in Point Pleasant and stuff. You know, so there was a there was a little bit of a connection to a lot of those sightings and stuff. But the the main one was you know here in uh, November fifteenth, and then for about two weeks straight after that, there were people seeing it all over the place. You know, wow. in Point Pleasant, right across the river, in Gallipolis, and Huntington, Charleston, places like that. So you know, and it's it still remains a mystery to this day as to what it actually was you know there was a lot of different theories and you know things like that and there still there still are right yeah one of the things that you had mentioned about like linda every piece of video footage i've ever seen of her she Uh always seems so like almost still in fear of whatever she saw yeah yeah, you know, she she always told me that she, you know, she just hoped she never seen it again. Yeah, I would you know, it, it definitely <laughs> affected her, you know, uh, I would say mentally, uh, you know, because uh, she was one of the few witnesses that would really talk about it. And I think that the reason she did is she just didn't want people to, to doubt her story and stuff. I mean, and she told me, she said, I, I know what I saw. Uh, it wasn't a sandhill crane. It wasn't a bird. You know, this was this was something different, you know, because that was some of the theories were that it was a migrating sandhill crane, Mm -hmm. uh, an owl, a barn owl, you know, stuff like that. And a lot of those original witnesses were kind of put back by that, you know, insulted a little bit because it made them look like I mean, they didn't even know what a what an owl looked like, you know. Right, right. So. You know, yeah, it's, Joe even said, he said, you know, I've seen a lot of owls, but I've never seen one that stood seven foot tall. Right. <laughs> yeah, you. it almost, a, a lot of the put forth suggestions on what it could have been, I mean, it's almost insulting people's intelligence, especially people, yeah. you know, Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, Virginia. 
I mean, we, we see these animals on a pretty regular basis and to not be able to identify that. There were some witnesses that did say that it was, it was an enormous bird, Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, some of those people came forth and they said, now what we saw was, was gigantic. I mean, it was, it was a bird that looked as big as a helicopter, you know, chasing a car. And, uh, but then there were some that, that, that said it was more than just a bird. It was, you know, very peculiar. Um, you know, one lady told me that she'd seen all kinds of horror movies and she said, this, this looked like something right out of a movie, you know, what, what she saw. So. Right. Now, a lot of the accounts talk about these glowing red eyes. Can you kind of elaborate on that? Yeah, that was a, a common thing that a lot of people did see was the red eyes. You know, they said they were almost hypnotic, hmm. you know, when they were kind of riveted to those red eyes because in a lot of the interviews that I did, I would ask them, you know, did they have any facial features, a nose, a mouth or whatever? And they said, well, you know, we, we were looking at the eyes, you know, that's what caught our attention and stuff. Hmm. And, um, you know, that's, that was uh, the same thing that she said, that those eyes were almost a nocturnal type animal's eyes that they right. saw. And then there was some that said that we didn't notice any eyes. We were too scared <laughs> running the other way, you know. Mm-hmm. And we didn't stick around to, to check. Yeah. Well, I, if I saw something with glowing red eyes looking at me, I don't think I'd want to hang around too long either. But right. And it's kind of funny, right. too, because a lot of people say, now, that I, I don't want to, cross topics here but a lot of people say like with when they see a bigfoot at night that it has glowing red eyes or it has like right. a, a bioluminescence right. about the eyes yeah but, but another like thing you see a possum or whatever the way their eyes look but they're not red you know? r- right well you said about like a lot of nocturnal animals like the like owls and yeah. uh, rabbits they like if you uh get a light in their eyes at night they they glow red so i don't know if it maybe you know if people are trying to write it off as an owl you know that that right. would make sense you know, right. but uh, so with all these sightings, I would imagine there's probably a lot of pandemonium kind of going on or a lot of like people's uh, people oh, are on yeah. edge. So what was yeah. the, the feeling like in the town during that time? Well, you know, a lot of people wanted to go out looking for it. Mm-hmm. And I always said it was like a hunt for Frankenstein. You know, <laughs> um, they were all in the TNT area and lined up in the cars and miles of cars you know and then then people were bringing guns and rifles and mm. you know it was almost like a wild turkey shoot or whatever yeah, uh, yeah you know my dad actually took me and my mom up of course i was so young i didn't remember but he was just curious you know he he actually worked up there in the tnt area at the national guard armory uh-huh. and um you know he never did see anything but you know i asked my mom what he thought about all of it and, and you know he was he was kind of a a tough sale, you know, and stuff uh-huh. like that. But she said he, he kind of believed their stories, you know, cause we knew him, you know, we knew him there from being on our street and everything. And, yeah. And he, he didn't discount what they said, you know, but, uh, he, he thought there was something to it, you know, and a lot of people did, you know, I, I think it got to the point where, you know, at first everybody said, well, you know, it's just four young kids up there that are drinking and carrying on. But then you had other people seeing it like prominent business people and, you know, well-known people in the community started seeing it, and then and then they're like, "Well, there must be something to it." You know, right? Because I mean, to what benefit would they have of telling exactly. a story? Yeah. Right. And there's people to this day that saw it that never did tell anybody. I, I talk to people all the time in the museum mm-hmm. that'll come in and they'll say, "You know, we saw that thing, but we never told anybody because we figured they'd think we were all crazy and stuff." Mm-hmm. So, I, I would say if you had a hundred reported sightings, there's probably at least two or three hundred total people didn't say it didn't say anything you know yeah that's common throughout all the uh different kind of cryptid creatures or people you know they they had some kind of a sighting that they can't explain but for fear of ridicule right. they don't want to open their mouth yeah well their jobs or their careers and i i really you know back then it was a lot more conservative too true know, but true yeah well now today, uh, everything's you mainstream it, you probably wouldn't say much about it you know? right right well the world's crazy these days right. <laughs> yeah yeah but uh, now you said that your dad worked up in the TNT area, correct? He, the, the National Guard Armory was located up there in the TNT area at that time. Yeah. And and he he or any of his coworkers ever notice anything? Well, the norm? in John Keel's book, John Keel talks about two National Guardsmen who saw something 
struggling in a treetop, and they reported it. And, you know, to this day, I don't know who those guys were because I, I thought, well, you know, I'd, I'd like to know who they were. And right. you know, I've asked around, you know, my dad passed away years ago, but, you know, talking to some of these other old guys that worked with him, I always asked them, you know, who was it that, that reported that, that Mothman sighting? And, and, and nobody can ever tell me, so I don't know. Mm-hmm. But, but John Keel specifically says two National Guardsmen, you know, in the TNT area reported that, so... Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. So, um, the name Mothman. Right. Where Where did that originate from? Well, this was in 1966. Um, most of the people here refer to it as the Big Bird, you know. Uh, but there was a local newspaper reporter. They would have press conferences. Somebody in the press named it Mothman. Because at that time, uh, Batman was a popular TV show. There was mm-hmm. a character in that show, Mothman. Um, there was a comic book character or whatever. Uh-huh. And then people said it had moth-like wings, you know, when they saw it. And the name kind of just stuck, you know. Yeah. But so it, a came lot from, it came from a Batman still comic. Still referred to it as a bird, you know. Yeah. But the so name Jack- stuck with it. Uh, can you give us a like a what is the description of Mothman? You know, I, I know there's different accounts, but what is the most like common similar features? Uh, six to seven foot tall, ten to twelve foot wingspan, the two red eyes, uh, the head shrunken down into the shoulders, almost to where the head wasn't prominent. Hmm. Um, some people said it looked like it had feathers. Other people said it looked like it had like bat wings, leathery type skin. Uh, not a lot of people described any arms or anything like that. Uh, some people seen it perched, you know, on top of buildings. Mm-hmm. Other people got chased in the car. You know, some people reported seeing it peering in their windows, you know, <laughs> looking sitting on a roof the next to their house appearing in their window hmm. almost like a gargoyle type thing so yeah that's those are the common common descriptions uh sort of a grayish collar like a dirty gray mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but it would have like i would assume like a, a human body and legs yeah yeah you know, it, had, it, it had a torso and and legs and stuff and but a lot of people said that its head looked like it was almost like a, a robin, like a bird. It was broad shoulders, and the head was sunken down into the shoulders a little little ways. Huh. Very odd. Yeah. No, yeah. you had mentioned, Jeff, about, like, the UFO sightings and stuff like that. You know, can you give us a little more background on that? Because that seems to be, like, a, a big part of the – like 60s into the 70s with a lot of cryptids and UFOs being connected around the same time in the similar areas? Right. Well, you know, basically I I never really, you know, saw much. I've talked to a lot of people that were seeing stuff in broad daylight, you know. Um, one lady said she was pulling in her driveway and one just went right over top of her house. She could hear the buzzing noise as it went over. Um, John Keel... I uh, always had a theory that this was actually a, a military type activity going on because um, he he you know went back and forth up in in Dayton Ohio with the Wright Patterson Air Force Base mm-hmm. and yeah. he always had a theory that that this was during the middle of Vietnam too so um, mm-hmm. he told me and told some other people that that. Uh, that Wright Patterson was actually running maneuvers along the Ohio River uh, and not telling anybody, you know, because they were they were testing out some maybe I don't know stealth technology. Who knows? Because there were people said they'd see stuff and it would just disappear, you know, real quick. And you know, the terrain along the Ohio River was a lot like in Vietnam, you know, the mm-hmm. jungle, the common stuff. And there's really no rivers in Dayton. I don't think that they could even do that stuff with. So that was. That was one of the theories that he talked about, that uh, he said he would call up there. And, of course, you know, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to say, yeah, yeah, we're doing that. And stuff. But that was one of his theories. 
Yeah, I was going to say Wright Patterson uh, seems to be thrown into a lot of UFO and, you yeah. know, Roswell connected to Wright Patterson. Yeah. And it always seems to end up that way. Yeah, I think there um, were some uh, big for, uh, Bigfoot claims in the uh, close to the Pittsburgh area in Pennsylvania where there was a Bigfoot UFO connection. And I think the uh, one of them crashed and I think they, they said they took it down to that base as oh, well. Yeah, you know, I've actually talked to several people that's been in the museum. That's even one of them, one guy worked there. Uh huh. And, you know, and of course I joke around with him and stuff, but he told me he's seen stuff up there that he was never, never allowed to talk about. Now, I don't know what he meant by that, <laughs> but he had some really high, high clearance, you know, that Wright, Wright Patterson Air Force Base and stuff. Hmm. So, you know, he didn't elaborate and, you know, he seemed like he was pretty serious to me, but, you know, talk, talk to air, airline pilots for commercial airlines, you know, talking about all the UFOs and stuff that they would see while they're in mid flight. And uh, one of them was, I don't know who he was with, American Airlines or someone, a big one. Mm-hmm. He said it got to the point where, you know, they were supposed to write reports up on all that stuff. And he said it got to the point where they just told him not to even write anything. There was so many people seeing it. Oh. He said the passengers were seeing, seeing the stuff flying up past the plane and all that. And uh, he said it got to the point where his superiors just told him, don't, don't even – don't even bother because <laughs> there was so many of them they couldn't keep up keep up with them Jeez. now that was that was probably all over the country that wasn't i'm not saying that was just in in our area here right 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 but, but i meet a lot of interesting people that come to the museum and stuff you know you know I, I i hate to say this but i have not i have yet to be uh over uh it, it or, or i should say down to west virginia to to one of the festivals but I, i've got to mm-hmm. get down to one of the the Mothman festivals, and I have to see the museum. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It's uh, we drew probably ten thousand last year wow. for the for the two day event, and you know we had guest speakers and authors, and John Keel came to a couple of them back in the day, and uh, you know a lot of those people that come. You know we had a lot of UFO type uh, related stuff, and, and uh, of course Mothman and other cryptids and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh and it's a free event, you know, we have all kinds of stuff. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Now I have to ask a question, Jeff, and every time I say this person's name I get the coldest chill down my spine. Um <laughs> and I don't know why. Um I have this strange connection for some reason to this person's name. Uh-huh. But can you tell us a little bit about Injured Cold, the grinning man? Well, Indrid Cold was, you know, that happened, uh, that was in November 66. That happened about an hour away in Mineral Wells, West Virginia. And John Keel wrote about that in, in his book, The Mothman Prophecies, because that was a UFO-related incident, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a guy driving down the road named Woody Derenberger. Uh, he was a salesman, and he was heading down uh, Route 77, I think it was, and he claimed that this spacecraft landed in the middle of the road. He stopped his car. Someone got out of that spacecraft and walked up and started communicating with him, uh, talking to him and told him his name was Andrew Cold and he would see him again in time. Uh, he reported it to all the news channels and stuff like that. And um, he was kind of like Starberry and a lot of people didn't believe him and made fun of him and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, that was that that happened about the same time as the Mothman stuff. So that's why Ann Keel investigated a lot of the UFO stuff too, not just the Mothman stuff. But you know, he he came to Point Pleasant and would go looking for the the UFOs and stuff. Hmm. Yeah, I have the strangest connection. Every time I get involved or look into anything with the Mothman, I end up uh-huh. either having uh, technical difficulties, or oh, I get yeah. every time I bring up injured cold, I get this this horrible shiver down the base of my spine. I do yeah. not get why. <laughs> and it is funny too because right before we tried to go on air last week, 
he and I were he, like he was kind of talking to me about uh, in injury cold, and and that's when my internet basically <laughs> shut down. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me! Really? Yeah, it was yeah, pretty that, pretty weird. Yeah, yeah, could be a coincidence, you know. It, it, and you know, sometimes you wonder. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, well, I'll I'll go back even further. Years ago, I was listening to Coast to Coast AM. Uh-huh. And they, I believe it was John Keel was on with, I think at the time it was still Art Bell on. Right, and right. And I was sitting in a car, I was at work, and it was me and my partner were on duty at a uh, nursing home for a strike. And we were listening to it, and they were talking about the Mothman. And all of a sudden, uh-huh. the interior lights of the car started flashing. And the oh, radio really? kept cutting in and out. Yeah, it was the strangest. It never happened after that or before that. But it was just the Mothman, for some reason, has always had this draw for me. And it's always yeah. a little weird around it. We were uh, a couple, uh, two or three weeks ago, we was on a cruise. And we were in, um, <clears throat> in the Bahamas. And I walked up to the, we were on this island. And they had rentals, you know, where you could rent like the rafts and, and floats and all that kind of stuff. And I walked up to sign the paper to get it. And this huge moth. It was a bat like moth come flying out of the out of the little building and hit me like in the shoulder and bounced off and I asked that lady, I said, What was that? And she said, It's like a little bat type moth. She she named it. And I just thought that was kind of ironic, you know, and it pretty much hit me in the shoulder and then it hit her and then it flew off. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back and told my wife, I said, you know, moth man's up there in the the little shanty there where they're renting the booth or the and stuff. Weird. <laughs> yeah, it definitely has some strange, uh, you know, coincidences that do happen around it. Well, yeah, yeah. You know, some of those witnesses, you know, talked about stuff, uh, Linda in particular, you know, uh, she just always felt really like she was being watched all the time, you know, paranoid. And she said she'd hear footsteps on the top of their house and, all kinds of stuff, hmm. you know, the garbled voices on the phone, you know, the crank calls and the voice would be garbled. So that, that would definitely keep you on edge, you know? Oh yeah. Now out of like the hundred eyewitnesses that admitted to seeing this, when the silver bridge collapsed, did any of them actually perish when it collapsed? I don't think so. Not not that I know of. There was 46 people who, who died on the bridge. Um, I've never been able to, to, you know, verify that from anybody, you know. Um, that happened in 67, so that was a year later and stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, nobody's ever came forth and said they were an actual witness, you know, mm-hmm. to any of that stuff. Can you go into more detail about the uh, connection to the Mothman and the Silver Bridge collapse? Well, you know, there's some people that thought since all that was going on at the same time that it was kind of ironic, you know, that the bridge collapsed. But there's the other people that say, you know, that the bridge was 40 years old. It was in bad shape. Mm-hmm. You did not have any of the bridge inspections like you do now. Well, the reason you have bridge inspections now is because of that bridge disaster. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Lyndon Johnson, the day after that bridge fell, initiated a, a new way of, you know, uh, looking at those bridges and inspecting them and stuff. But, um, you know, it, it just it was a bad time. And a lot of people's attention went from hunting the Mothman to, you know, the recovery of bodies and stuff from the river and stuff. So, right. you know, the movie really pushed that really heavy, uh, you know, that – you know, it had something to do with the bridge collapse and stuff like that. And it kind of sensationalized and everything. Mm-hmm. The actual reason the bridge fell was because of the eye bar, you know, that, that sheared and snapped and and pretty much just went like a stack of cards right across, you know, the river there. Wow. Now, like some of the things that I had read and what and whatnot about the Mothman and, and the bridge collapses, some people said that they saw red eyes on – top of the bridge and all this stuff and you you didn't hear anything about that or well i've always heard people talk about and stuff it's just real hard to verify right. that you know and validate it i think you know 
as the legend gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it's just like the people that come in the museum. And, and I bet you I probably heard a thousand people tell me that they had just got off of that bridge before it fell. And I thought there's no way that many people could be in town. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's, they have that, that personal connection to the bridge and they were all on that bridge five minutes before it fell yeah. or had drove across it the day before or had just, you know what I mean? So it's mm. like, how could that be? But, you know. It's, it's weird. Now, ha- yeah. has, have, has there been any Mothman sightings since December 15th of 67? Yeah, there was a lot, you know, that still went on because a lot of people thought, well, the bridge fell and all the sightings ended. But, you know, there, I had talked to people seeing stuff clear up, you know, you know, to the 70s and 80s and stuff like that. It wasn't it wasn't as heavy as it was in the 60s. Um, you know, there, there was uh, last spring, you know, somebody took a picture of something flying over the car. Um, you know, they sent that to the news stations. They they were all calling me, asking me about it and stuff. I I wasn't really aware of what, you know, they'd sent in and stuff. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, you know, again, it's hard to validate every single thing that you see on the Internet and Facebook and on the yeah. news and stuff like that. Of course, you know, all this stuff going on in Chicago, you know, people seeing stuff up there. Right, you know, right. It may be the same thing that people are seeing here. It might be some coincidence or whatever. But, uh yeah, that was one of our next questions is, do you think yeah. that the stuff that's happening in the greater Chicago area is related to or in, in any kind of correlation to Point Pleasant, I guess? Well, uh, as, immediately when people say Mothman, you know, they, they refer back to Point Pleasant and stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple of the guest speakers this year that's going to be talking about the about that, you know, mm-hmm. the sightings up there and stuff like that. Um, you know, I've I've talked to people, a few people that's been in and said that stuff was going on. So who knows? I mean, you know, 50 years later, it, it could be, you know, <laughs> something starting all over again. Mm, true. I mean, there's there's uh, sightings of winged hominoids and all throughout the United States and really the world. So, I mean. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, there were sightings of the, the big the gigantic bird-type creatures in Texas there. Mm-hmm the mid seventies and, and, uh, the owl man and all kinds of stuff, you know, flying, you know, <clears throat> creatures or whatever. But yeah, again, you know, it's the question is where they all related and stuff, you know? Right. <clears throat> right. Right. That's like the, uh, like, like the Thunderbird or whatever it is in the Pacific Northwest that people say, right. like some people say, Oh, it's a giant bird or, Oh, it's a winged hominid and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So you never know. You never know. Yeah. But uh, so can you tell us uh, a little bit more about uh, the Mothman Museum and what people can expect to see at the museum? Well, like I said, the museum I started about 10 years ago. Um, We have a lot of the movie props in there Mm -hmm. that were used in uh, Richard Gere's movie, The Mothman Prophecy. Cool. Which came out in 2002. Mm -hmm. Uh, Those were all donated by a, a gentleman up there in Catani, Pennsylvania, where they filmed that movie. And uh, he used to bring all that stuff to the festivals, and it got to the point where he couldn't couldn't bring it all, so he donated. That was the kind of the, the catalyst for the museum. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, we've got costumes, we've got Silver Bridge archives, we've got police reports, we've got uh, a few things on Woody Derenberger and Edward Cole. Um, we have stuff, you know, some UFO stuff, uh, we got a media room, you know, where you can watch documentaries and uh, just all kinds of stuff like that. You know, it's a um, awesome. pretty nice gift shop and uh, it's it's kind of a learning center. You know what I mean? You come yeah. in and spend three hours there, or you can spend five minutes. It just depends on the interest level and stuff. Right, right. And uh, what are what are your hours there? Like when are you open? We're open every day. When we first started, we was just open on weekends. But it got to the point where we're open every day from uh, – Right now, from eleven to five, and then on Sundays, uh, yeah, 11, uh, noon to five. Okay. And of course, the summer hours. You know, we've got the websites and the Facebook pages and all that. But, cool, and that's uh, where people could find the hours and admission oh, yeah. fee. Is there an admission fee to to the museum? 
there's three dollars, three dollars, and I've kept it the same ever since I opened it. It's a dollar for kids, ten and under. You can't and, beat uh, that. No, and you know, like I said, uh, uh, we have enough people that come through there that you know offsets our expenses, and of course, the gift shop does real well. And we ship stuff off online and all kinds of stuff like that. So. Awesome. Now you were talking about the uh, the Mothman Festival coming up. You said in two weeks in September. Uh, yeah, do you want to give some 17th. dates and everything that people could uh, check you out? Yeah, that, that'll be September 16th and 17th, mm-hmm. the Saturday you know, and Sunday. And um, you can go to mothmanfestival.com. There's also an app that we have for the festival that you can find on there. It tells you how to download it and all that kind of stuff. Great. Of course, some Facebook pages for the Mothman Festival. So all everything's out there and it gives you a list of all the guest speakers and you know the attractions and all that kind of stuff what all goes on so awesome. you know try to keep everybody informed the best we can but um that's it's all there that sounds great well we have a few events coming up uh or an event i should say i don't want to say few but uh, we have an event that we want to partake in but i, I really want to try and uh get out for the festival. I want to check out the museum and, 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 and if luck is on our side, maybe we could meet in person and, and, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. have Just a little conversation because I teach uh, graphic design during the day, you know, at the local, uh, career center at the high school and stuff. So that's, you know, I do that full time. And then of course the museum is full time too. So. Man, I gotta tell you, we must be cut from the same cloth because I was in bands throughout the early parts of my life. And I thought I was oh, yeah. going to be a rock star. I'm into yeah. monsters and all the weird things. And I actually have a graphic design business, uh, of my own as well. So. Oh, really? <laughs> boy, That's oh cool. boy, that, we're pretty, pretty uh, similar here. <laughs> yeah. I, I talk to people all the time that come in that museum and as a matter of fact, there was a, there was a couple that came in last night, and they wanted to take me to dinner, uh-huh. and they'd emailed me and everything, and, and so we went down the street to eat, and, and the guy was like, uh, every band that I talked about that I liked, that was, it was almost like we were identical as far as the, the music <laughs> that we liked, and it was just sort of like, that's weird, you know, we, and I thought, I didn't think anybody had ever heard of that band or whatever, but... Uh, yeah, you know, it's. I think they kind of go hand in hand. You know, art and music and monsters and yeah, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Well, artists know. are usually kind of uh, in their own little world. Yeah, so yeah. it's kind of cool. You know. Yeah. So I, we That's have cool. a couple more questions for you. If you, okay. if you are you still good to talk? Yeah, I'm fine. All right, cool. So one of the things is, uh, how is the cleanup going in the old TNT area now? Like, how are things in modern days compared to back then? Well, you know, during the 70s, that was an EPA cleanup site because of all the contaminants from World War II. Mm-hmm. And that was a theory that whatever this thing was might have been a mutated bird or creature or something like that. Mm-hmm. But they come in and took off, I think, three inches of topsoil. Um, a lot of the structures, like the North Power Plant, is they're no longer there. They tore those down probably 25 years ago. Mm. Um, I wish they would have left them up because, you know, so many people are, you know, we have some replicas and models of them in the museum, but that was just such a big liability for the state that people were in there all the time. Right. A couple right. people jumped off the top, you know, and they survived, but they, they jumped off and, Jeez. you know, hit the bushes and stuff. <laughs> but, um, you know, so they just come in and just tore them down. Right, but right. Uh, that was a big part of that history of of those sightings, and a lot of the the locals here called those, those it was the birdhouse. You know, they called it the birdhouse because that's where people were seeing it all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things I you know I've heard people bring up, and I'm not a big fan of this. Um, is there some theory with the number thirteen? And the Silver Bridge collapse and the Mothman, some kind of connection there? Well, you know, some people thought that, you know, the um, the bridge fell exactly 13 months to the day after that Linda and them sighting. And the eye bar that sheared was eye bar number 13. So that's where that comes from, you know. Uh, 13 being an unlucky number, which I was born on the 13th. So. Well, there you go. <laughs> but, uh, 
but that that wouldn't have anything to do with it. But uh, yeah, that that's where that came from. You know, people were playing the number game, and that kind of stuck. And I think there might be another thirteen in there somewhere. I can't remember what it would be, but you know, I'm sure if you look hard enough, you might be able to find it. Well, I think with a lot of things too, a lot of the different uh, uh, unknown or, or cryptic creatures, if you will. There, I, and really, with with anything, there's so many theories, and and uh, I don't know if we want to call them conspiracy theories or what, but right. correlations to to numbers and symbols and this and that, yeah. and signs of bad luck and this and that. So I, I don't know. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and it's it's. Uh, I think you know, with the Mothman story, that's kind of the beauty of it. I mean, it's an open book. I mean, there's right. all kinds of theories and you know, people's different opinions as to what it was and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, if you spend enough time thinking about something, you, you start picking up exactly. everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, but, I mean, that, that I, I guess uh, this, that was our list of questions for you, Jeff, is what oh, I'm trying okay. to spit out here. So I just want to thank you so much. Well, for actually, coming I, ha- oh, I have oh, one sorry. other question. No, no, we're not done yet. Sorry, I I spoke too soon. (laughs) Now, this is completely off the subject of Mothman, but I've seen in some of the stuff that was written about you, you're a huge Kiss fan. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Favorite Kiss Kiss lineup? Well, obviously, Gene, Peter, Paul, and Ace. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, good, good. That that to me was was Kiss. I mean, you know, uh, I've seen them in 78 almost almost 40 years ago and that pretty much changed me as far as you know what what i wanted to do because you know i'd only read about them in magazines there was no internet or anything and yeah on tv and and you know to see them right there in front of me there on stage was just like this is this is weird you know so but yeah, yeah we I, actually- always, I always i always like jeans uh you know, he was into the monsters and the, the sci-fi and all that kind of stuff. And to, I think that was why I was attracted to band, uh, bands like Kiss. You know, they just were, you know, right out of a comic book, you know. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, we actually got to see Kiss and Aerosmith, um, one of the last tours Kiss did the makeup for yeah. back yeah. in the, I guess, early 2000s, less than I actually saw them. Yeah. I, I've been lucky enough to meet Gene two or three times, you know, just in passing. It wasn't like, you know, we had dinner together or anything like that. Yeah. Um, I actually gave him one of my band's albums that we did and stuff. And, and um, you know, because I just, to, to me, they were always a big influence and stuff. And, and uh, as a matter of fact, that first book, Facts Behind the Legend, um, you remember when he did his first book and he did the book tour and went around all the Barnes and Nobles and all that. Mm-hmm. And somehow uh, we knew somebody who was following him around and we FedExed the book to give to him. You know, when they got up to him in line to have him sign his book, they were going to give him, you know, the Mothman Fox Behind the Legend book. Mm-hmm. And I had the picture somewhere of them giving it to him. But when she handed it to him, he looked at the book and he looked at her and he says, so did they catch it? So he knew all about the Mothman stuff. So. <laughs> That's and, pretty uh, cool. Yeah. He said, did they catch it? And she said, I don't know. They just told me to give you the book. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? Speaking of books, I know uh, you had written two. Do you want to plug them again? Give the names of the books and where people might be able to find them? Yeah. You know, the first one was uh, Mothman Facts Behind the Legend. Um, you can find that on our website, you know, mothmanmuseum.com. And then the second one was in 2005 was, uh, Mothman, uh, behind the red eyes. And uh, you know, there may be a third one, you know, I'm, I'm still, if I can find time to, to get a third one out there, you know, I probably will. Are, are you plugging the official teaser on our show, Jeff? Is that, is that what well, you're doing? Yeah, I've been to other places, but you know, the people still ask me and, is there going to be a third book? And, you know, I would, I would hope that, that I can do that, you know, well, we hope so to too. Be, it has to be some very rare, uh, archives in there though. It's, I just don't want to put something out for the sake of putting it out. You right. Know? Right. Of course. Yeah. It's like an album. I mean, you know, you don't want to put filler stuff out. You want to put, 
Yeah, of course, nobody puts out albums anymore. I was going to say that, like, you mean like most albums these days? <laughs> yeah, color. it's sad. It's sad. I mean, I, I think, you know, kids now, I mean, I talked to those kids in my class, and they, I asked some of them, you know, I mentioned Napster. They had no clue what I was talking about. Oh, right, right. Now, their parents were actually <laughs> the ones that came into my stores, you know. So. Uh-huh. But, yeah, that's. It was good while it lasted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. I so, actually had a I had to explain Napster to a bunch of people the other day because they had no concept of what it was when it happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it ruined the music industry. Some of it, you know. I mean, the downloading and all that. I mean, and you can't blame kids for not wanting to pay sixteen, twenty bucks for a CD. I mean. Yeah, if you can get yeah, it for the record, free. The record yeah. labels got too greedy too. So mm-hmm. yeah. there's no record labels left either. So yeah, yeah. So one one last question, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, that's fine. So we talked about the the Mothman. We talked about some of the events that had happened, some of the eyewitness stories and stuff. Now maybe let's go back a little bit in in history and talk about. Do you, do you know anything about the Chief Cornstalk curse? Well, yeah, the. In in uh, the 1700s, Chief Cornstalk was a Shawnee chief uh, who was murdered um, over a land dispute. Him and his son both were shot, and uh, the the story goes that you know up on his dying breath, you know he said he would curse the town of Point Pleasant for 200 years. Now, you know there's people that that believe that, and then there's other people said that that was all derived from a old stage play from like the 20s or whatever hmm. somebody threw that line in there to make it sound exciting um we've actually got a, a lady who will be a guest speaker there at the festival who's like a seventh generation granddaughter mm-hmm. of cornstalk and she's going to talk about all that now she doesn't believe in that curse you know she thinks that he got blamed for a lot of the bad things like the bridge and you know mothman and all that kind of stuff so mm-hmm. It depends on who you talk to on that, but that that is in the history books. He's actually buried just right two blocks away from the museum. Oh, really? Wow. Park, yeah. Huh. So, um, but that's that's the story behind Chief Cornstalk. Yeah. Well, there you go. Well, Jeff, I want to personally thank you, and I know Chad will as well. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And again, I truly apologize for last week. I mean, that oh, was, that's not your fault. That's no, it fault. was the Mothman's fault. I mean, I think we've we've figured that yeah. out. You know? <laughs> Andrew Cole got in there messing with the wires and stuff. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But no, seriously, thank you so much. You were you're you're an awesome guest. You are you know not only our first guest, but you were a great guest. So well, I'm happy to have been on the show, and uh, I'm sure we'll meet again. I hope so. I, I look forward to coming out to the festival, and I want to check out the museum. And, and once again, the dates of the festival? It would be September 16th and 17th. And that is yeah. in Point Pleasant. Right. Uh-huh. West Virginia. Yep. Awesome. And you can check it out on the website. Give the website again. Uh, MothmanFestival.com. Perfect. All right, Jeff. Again, thank you so okay. much, Chad. you want to yes. say anything else? Yes, thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate your time. And like I said, you were actually the first person – not just that we got to interview, but the first person on my list to interview, and I'm well, so happy to have this chance. I appreciate that. That that sounds cool to me. So, yeah. Yeah. All right, my friend. Well, hopefully, we'll talk again soon. And then, you know, okay. until just then, let me know have... if coming to Point Pleasant. I'll I'll be there. Absolutely. You have a great night, my friend. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Take thank care. You. All right. Well, that was pretty pretty cool. We had our first live guest on our show, uh, Jeff Wamsley. Again, he's a, a, a Mothman uh, author, fan. researcher, the whole you know, nine. historian. Yeah. Yep. Got his own festival. He's got his own museum. Uh, totally cool guy to talk yeah. to, obviously, as you guys all got the pleasure of hearing. He's, uh, you know, vast knowledge of the, the topic. So that was pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely the, one of the reasons I think um, that Jeff kind of stuck out in my head as somebody being the person I wanted to interview first. Um, just the fact that he's, he's a town, you know, it's his, it's his town, his County 
where he's from that he's he's talking about people he knew you know to know the people you know you can you can have third hand accounts of what people have said but there's right. a man who actually knew the people that were witnesses sat down with and knew them not just as witnesses but knew them as people and had a chance to sit down and just talk to them and you know kind of get to know them and, and then hear these stories and kind of right. put like he said putting the faces to the names and realizing that these are his neighbors and his community that he uh you know grew up in so he's definitely you know somebody i would love to have back on the show again Absolutely. you know hopefully you know when he does his next book or maybe next time there's a mothman sighting in point pleasant he'll come on with us again yeah and give us the the lowdown on that yeah yeah because he's cool because all this is 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 personal it's not just a passion that oh yeah i'm in the to, to mothman like some people are into bigfoot and whatnot this is a passion for him it's personal like chad said it's his hometown and whatnot and uh he's not one of those guys that are out there to make a buttload of money he's not you know torn all over the place to looking looking to make profit off this he's just your your average joe who's totally into something and that that's in his hometown so again really cool guy really cool person to talk to Glad we had him on the show. Glad he was our first guest. So we talked about that chief cornstalk curse about uh, about the land and everything. So that that was kind of interesting to to, to hear about that. That it was, you know, a possible uh, Indian chief and his son who were who were murdered, and yeah, they placed a curse on the town. Yeah, that that whole uh situation was you know basically they had kidnapped a whole bunch of the indian leaders mm -hmm. in the you know the chiefs and the higher members of the tribes and held them like a as hostages to stop the attacks against the fort and the and the, the you know the early community right and you know the, eventually what i guess two guys went out hunting and the indians you know ambushed them one of them made it back to the fort and when he made it back to the fort he basically told him what happened and in a rage i guess the the guards and all just decided to you know get retribution on the prisoners they had you know and it you know it, again it, it's the 1700s uh you know like Jeff said, it, it it might have been a play in the 1920s that added this piece of history of this curse and all that, you know. So it, it's interesting, but like we were, you know, and I now that Jeff's off the phone, of course, I have 10 questions I just thought of. <laughs> of course. Um, you know, one of the things we didn't really get into is like, you know, when I opened the show, we were talking about the, you know, cr how it, it, it's kind of like a... Um, cross section of paranormal you know events between ufos uh cryptid uh you know i mean there's even to, to go back to a, a show ago there's actually even poltergeist activity reported in point pleasant during this time mm -hmm. you know so it, it's it, it's so much weird occurrences and, and just things happening in such a way and in, in such a small, you know, 13 month time frame, you know, that you're having, you know, leading up to this, you're having UFO sightings. You have Wright Patterson air force base where I guess they, you know, allegedly took the Roswell UFO and you know, the Kecksburg UFO and, and just so many different, you know, things that happened around there. And then, you know, you have a flying winged humanoid cryptid, you know, running awesome. around the woods in, in a, a part of town. And, and one of the things like I, I'm pretty sure Jeff had mentioned was this wasn't just seen out in the woods or out in the country. This was seen in town in, in yeah, the small peek, community of Point Pleasant. People's windows and, you know, yeah. in broad daylight. Yeah. You know, that's the, the thing, like, you know, like he had mentioned, there were some sightings that happened prior to the the Point Pleasant sightings, you know, the, the, the grave digging crew seeing a flying humanoid. Mm -hmm. Now, like uh, he said, you know, that's an hour or so away, but 
you know, it, it's quite interesting that it's all happening in that 19, November of 1966. All this, you know, stuff starts popping and happening, you know, an hour, two hours, and to have 100 witnesses in a small community. I think the community was like 5,000 people total. Yeah. You know, so to have this many uh, 100 witnesses in that, like he said, you're probably dealing with two to 300 people who just never came forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, how many more people have seen it? How many more people experience stuff? So you you, mm-hmm. you don't know because a lot of people are afraid to come come forward because they're they're afraid to ridicule. They're afraid of being made out to be, you know, idiots or whatever. You know, and they don't want their name tarnished. Especially back then, like he said, you know, things were more conservative and and not so like nowadays it's not uncommon for people to talk about this stuff because i mean you have bigfoot shows you have ghost shows you have you know you shows have this podcast you have, you have yeah exactly well yeah and yeah. It's, it's accepted it's more widely accepted now whereas people would probably not be so put back i mean yeah of course people are still gonna laugh people are still gonna you know have their fun and take you know take their their shots at you but it's not like back then where, where your your job could be at Jeopardy because you said, oh, hey, I saw this thing. Well, it might make the business look bad. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know? Yeah. The, the, one of the things that, yeah, like Jeff had pointed out was the fact that prominent business people in town were coming forward saying, yeah, I saw something. You know, it, it was out here on this night. You know, at this time, this is what it looked like. Um you know, there was two firefighters um, that cited, you know, what they thought was a large bird with red eyes. Uh-huh. You know, so this isn't just, you know, like he said, you know, it's not just a bunch of kids out in an area drinking and, and partying, you know, in the 60s and, and coming home and, you know, thinking they're seeing something or creating this. You know, if you were going to get in trouble, like he said, I believe they were already married at the time. Right. If you were going to get in trouble for coming home late, you make up a story. These people had no reason to make up a story. And Linda Scarberry, every time I've ever seen that lady, you know, like he said, she's passed away. Yeah. But every time I've ever seen her interviewed about this, it is the weirdest, um, like, a fear. A yeah. A fear. Yeah. You know, like she always, she'd always kind of like sit there and be like, very stiff and answer questions and you could yeah. you could just read it in her facial expression and in her eyes like it's her whole still body scared just be locked up and it's almost like she was afraid to even say anything because it might bring it back yeah yeah so i mean they definitely to me it's like one of those things where they definitely witness something out of the ordinary now could it you know be the the 10,000 things they claim sandhill crane you know Owl. stuff like that yeah yeah i mean but you'd think like people you know they're quick to write off an explanation because that's all they have to do is give it a reasonable explanation and it's you know debunked right right but these people were affected for years and years after this by this you know creature or whatever it was and, and even you know into the 2000s this happened in 66 and 67 and these people in 2000 something were still afraid to talk about it like you know very clenched up and very uneasy talking about it right right but now there are things happening today in in different states like like there's a lot of stuff going on in chicago right now where they're seeing uh winged hominoids or hominids whatever uh flying around the area and stuff like that now, do you have any stories on that yeah i mean a lot of the stories you know basically there's actually a google um a google map set up for it uh-huh. and you know it's basically breaking down like people are saying a large bat like humanoid a large bat you know um basically again reporting a lot of the reports are reporting the glowing red eyes um yeah there was a report on 
in 2011, one of the earlier reports, it's probably about the third report, it was October 14th of 2011. They basically, um, in Washington Park near the University of Chicago, mm-hmm. um, basically they reported what they thought was a man with wings flying about 10 feet above them. And it was like a perfect silhouette against the evening sky. And one of the guys that witnessed it, I guess, was from Australia or New Zealand Mm -hmm. and basically said it looked like a sugar glider. One of those little like squirrel kind of things. Yeah. 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 So, I mean. (laughs) You froze there for a second. Are you all right? The Mm -hmm. sugar glider got got, got near and dear to your heart, didn't he? Yeah, they're cute little animals. They actually are, and and side note is I actually used to work with a guy who bred them, and he'd always tell me about them. But, anyways, uh, we're digressing here. So, what else? Any any other sightings in uh, Chicago? Um, yeah, I mean, there have been sightings. Basically, now they give it a um, red to reddish orange glowing eyes. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Miller Park area in Chicago, there was multiple sightings of two glowing eyes. They were like orangish red from the eyewitnesses. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, one of the women that saw it in that area basically looked out her window and the thing was in her yard staring back at her. Hmm. Um, and then like two minutes later, witnesses reported seeing a six to seven foot dark gray to black glowing eyes uh, sitting on a basketball rim down the street. Hmm. So like within a, you know, a couple blocks of this lady's house where she looked out a window and saw it within two minutes, people six to seven eyewitnesses reported seeing uh, uh, you know, uh, the same glowing set of eyes and they kind of gave it a little more of a description Right. Um, last time I looked, I believe it was up to almost over 37 eyewitnesses, you know, 37 eyewitness accounts of the creature. I'm, I'm pulling it up real quick just to give you an idea of the total number currently. We are up to 42 since 2011 now these are 42 again reported sightings right now how many of those are you know reported in the same area you know within a couple of minutes or an hour or so of each other um i keep saying um a lot tonight um what um huh But <laughs> you know what we're we're talking about, uh, and I don't think we elaborated much. Uh, Jeff had mentioned uh, John Keel. Mm-hmm. Now, in 1975, he wrote the wait, Mothman Prophecies. Right? Yeah, yeah. Which was the movie was based on his book, right? So he Loose, had a lot to do loosely, loosely based on yeah, his yeah. book. From what I remember. Of course, you know Hollywood, you know, overindulges, yeah. but uh, let's talk a little bit more about him. And his involvement. So he was a writer from where? Where did he come from? Do you um, even know? He was a writer. I'm trying to think of <clears throat> where he was originally from. But he had traveled there in, into that area to investigate the strange lights and all that, which, you know, Jeff had mentioned. Now, he, he and, was, is, he was, Richard Gere was supposed to be him, right? In yeah. Kind of loosely, kind of sort of. Yeah. Where he came into Point Pleasant trying to find information and he ended up getting sucked into it. Yeah, well, he was investigating the lights in the sky in that area Mm -hmm. and had read an article about, I guess, the uh, Linda Scarberry incident. Her her eyewitness account was covered in the paper. Mm -hmm. And I guess he happened to be reading the paper that day and decided to investigate this, you know, eyewitness account of, uh, you know, what becomes the Mothman. Mm -hmm. Um, He wasn't on the bridge. It's not like the Richard Gere Mothman prophecies in the end where he's on the bridge and the bridge collapse happens. 
yeah, he he lived until I. Oof, not sure if he's dead or not. So <laughs> don't, quote, kinda, don't quote him on that. Yeah, I, I do believe he has passed away, but. But he claimed that the Point Pleasant residents experienced precognitions, uh, including premonitions of the collapse of the Silver Bridge, UFO sightings, visits from mysterious from, visits from mysterious or threatening men in black. Uh, but he was criticized for distorting data and for being gullible, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess you know people had that knock on him. Yeah, it's. I guess it's easy to do, you know, to kind of discredit somebody on that point. You know, yeah, discrediting him in the sense of like, oh, you know, he took everybody at face value and maybe didn't use his full journalistic and research ability. Right. Um, you know, it was some were some of the stories probably made up along the way or enhanced? Yeah, I'm sure they were. Um, you know, but there was a hundred and some eyewitnesses that came forward and kind of stated similar but different features, similar but different you know locations. So you know. I'm sure some of it was distorted and I'm sure, you know, if you guys, you know, if anybody gets a chance to go to the museum, I'm sure Jeff has, like he said, he has all the original information of original correspondence of John Keels and stuff like that to witnesses and from witnesses. So you're going to see, you know, a good bit of, you know, you got to kind of make your own decision on, was he gullible on certain things? Yeah, but that brings us, you know, to the men in black involvement in this. You know, it's one thing we mentioned in the beginning. You know, I'd asked Jeff about Indrid Cole. Um, you know, he he's known as the grinning man. Mm-hmm. Uh and a lot of times like people do because in the in the Mothman Prophecy movie, the phone calls that Richard Gere gets that are the weird phone calls uh-huh. are a tribute are attributed to injured cold. The name that the person on the phone gives him is injured cold, which really isn't anything to do with reality or, you know, the, the actual happenings around there at that time. Hmm. Um, you know, one of the things with him is he injured cold is his first like reported sighting isn't even in Virginia or in West Virginia. It's actually in uh, New Jersey, I believe it was. And it was two kids with, you know, saw this guy standing behind a fence and kind of could see he had like this like shiny green outfit on. Yeah. But they thought there was something strange about him. So they were kind of like, they had to kind of walk that way. And as they got closer, I guess they started to realize, like, he didn't have all the parts of his face. Like, his nose was kind of missing. Hmm. And he just had this grin on his face. And they claimed that um, he chased them a couple blocks down the street until they finally got away. Of course, Indrid Cold, the grinning man is spotted in New Jersey. What is also spotted in New Jersey at the same time? No UFOs. UFOs. Exactly. (laughs) I thought you said the New Jersey devil. I'm sorry. I did. I did. Then you said UFOs. I'm like, yes, UFOs. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Sorry. I had to explain my joke to you. (laughs) Oh God, it's pretty bad. I don't get humor anymore. <laughs> but late. you know, there's a lot of reports that you know of this area having men in black and just strange people around town. You know, while this is all going on, now of course you start putting something like this in the newspaper, and 
strange people are going to start showing up because, you know, it's just like any Bigfoot sighting. Oh, Bigfoot spotted North Carolina. You now have every Tom, Dick, and Harry in North Carolina, Virginia, South Carolina coming to that part of, you know, North Carolina to try to see Bigfoot. Right. You know, so you're going to see weird people around town and, and, you know, some of these people are going to be kind of lurking around because I guess, you know, they basically, if you think about it, some people, you know, got a name, you know, oh, this was the lady who was the eyewitness. They knew where she worked and maybe they followed her home to see what her house looked like to kind of, and then they probably hung out in that neighborhood thinking, oh, well, we could go talk to her, but, you know, we kind of got to like bump into her to talk to her. So now, you know, some of the eyewitnesses are like, well, there are people following me. There's people, you know, sitting outside my home. They're, you know, getting prank phone calls because back then probably everybody's phone number was in a phone book. You know, right, it wasn't right. listed and stuff like that. Hmm. Well, I don't know, my friend. I don't yeah. know. I mean, well, like I said, you know, there's even poltergeist activity tied to all this. You know, the Lily family... Um, reported poltergeist activity in their home again. What they were seeing was uh, again, strangely enough, diamond-shaped lights. Yeah, yeah. And mm-hmm. you know, their daughter, of course, here's the female agent involved in the poltergeist, you know, phenomena. Yep. Uh, she basically reported seeing a man, a you know, a big, a large man, um, very broad couldn't see his face, but she could see the outline of him in the dark, basically grinning at her, Mm -hmm. you know, from in the dark. And basically she screamed, pulled the covers over her head, sat there for a little bit, pulled them down and then didn't see anything. Um, you know, again, poltergeist activity that a lot of times is explainable. So, you know, let's, uh, yeah, just about 11 o'clock. So I say we could probably get, put an end to this episode. Yeah. Well, we had a, a, well, we had our first guest, which was pretty awesome. Jeff, Jeff Wamsley. He's totally cool. And again, we got the, the Mothman festival coming up in two weeks. Uh, the Mothman museum that everybody could go check out while they're there. Enjoy the the speakers, and he did say that it was all free, right? The festival was a free festival. Festival's free, yes. Two uh, days it a, there. Yeah, it was a three dollar charge to see the museum, mm-hmm. which, folks, you got to realize three dollars is not that much, and it probably helps preserve a lot of, let's face it, the history that we're all interested in. You know, yeah, the cryptid, the the paranormal. Um, it's a small amount of money if you're in that area to check it out. Mm -hmm. Um, he has two books out. Um, we'll on Facebook tomorrow, I'll make sure I post all the, uh, festival information that I have, the Uh, museum information, the the books, you know, his book links and stuff like that. I mean, like I said, the first one I picked up years ago and it was, um, it was very interesting and informative. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it's written by somebody who grew up in that area, who's, you know, part of that community. So I think it's definitely worth checking out. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm going to wrap it up on my end. I'd like to thank my co-host, Les and Cavage, for doing such a great show. I'd like to thank Jeff Walmsley for being our, our guest and, mm-hmm. and enlightening us on some of the Mothman information. I'm hoping, you know, to have Jeff on again at some point and honestly hoping to get to the, you know, to the festival one of these years into the museum and, yeah. you know, get out there and maybe have him give us a tour of these areas. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So yeah, I, I also like want to th- th- uh, go ahead. I also want to thank the audience for coming along with us on of this. Course, you know, of course. It's a very interesting evening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'd like to thank everybody for listening and watching and uh, don't forget. Oh, I don't know if I mentioned this this week or not, but uh uh, it's looking like September 21st, the uh, Explorers. And again, it's not written in stone, but we're working on it. Uh, it's still a work in progress. But the Explorers are going to be hosting a, an event, a paranormal event, at the Harry Packer Mansion in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. 
Uh, tickets will be available. I don't know when yet, but I'm hoping to find out soon because the time is, is drawing near. Um, there's going to be a few uh, different organizations or shops in, uh, in the town of Jim Thorpe that are going to be participating. But we're hoping to have a uh, paranormal event at the Harry Packer Mansion. We're going to have everybody join us. Well, those who could who, who get a ticket, they're going to join us, and we're going to have we're going to talk about the history of the Harry Packer Mansion. We're going to talk about a little bit of what's going on there. We're going to try and talk about you know what we do. We'll give a little example of some of the equipment that we use when we're doing paranormal investigations, um, and then we're going to kind of do a walk through the area with with uh, the you all involved and. We'll do a live a live session and see what we can get. So that's just some of the stuff that's going to be happening. So uh, as we find out more, we're going to give you more. But until then, uh, tentative date is September 21st. Uh, so keep following us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, we'll try and give you guys as much info as we can. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I'd like to thank you for, for uh, joining in tonight, Chad, as always. And. Thank you guys all out there who are listening, which is probably just Leslie. So thanks for listening, Leslie. Um, <laughs> anything else? Um, you know, just uh, Explorers Group on Twitter. On you know, check us out on YouTube, Facebook. Uh, just a reminder: next week we will be on vacation, so there will not be a show next week. Um, so the next show will be the twelfth, I believe, of September. I think something like that. Something like it's Tuesday, folks. Yeah, it's Tuesday, Tuesday at nine thirty. So the, the Tuesday after Labor Day. Yeah. So hope you all have a safe and happy holiday. You know, enjoy your time. We're gonna enjoy our time off, and um, you know, we'll talk to you later. Yep. Yeah, that's right, folks. Tune in two weeks from now as we talk about the dog man and keep up to date on Facebook. So, good night, everybody, and good night, Chad. Night, Les. Good night. Are we I gotta wait for it. <laughs> no, I gotta wait for it to time us to the point where we're done talking. <laughs>